Emmanuel Murcielago will always be my dream car, but for the last, I don't know, many, many years, I've had the goal of buying a Bugatti Veyron. Now, that was partially based on already having my dream car, but still wanting some idea out there to sort of strive for and make it easier to work every day, but also because I truly love the cars. Ever since the production was announced in 2003, I just thought the cars were incredible, and I've talked a lot about how much I like the cars, cars that I've tried to buy, like the one that went into the Galveston Bay, one that was repossessed from a wrapper with a bank that I know well, Last year, I tried to buy a Chiron development car and tried to sell all my cars. But about a year and a half ago, I would say, I was probably in a position where if I sold all my cars, or maybe all but the Mercy, I would have been in a position to finance one, you know, have a gigantic payment that I might be able to float. And so I've been looking for them, but not necessarily finding exactly the right car. And so I ended up owning more Mercies, which is never, ever a bad thing. But in June of this year, I bought Missy Elliott Spiker. I talked about that in a recent video. And because of where the car was at her house in Delray Beach, I had John Tamarian from Curated send one of his truck drivers to go pick the car up. And it came back to his facility for them to put some fresh gas in it, fresh oil, and start it. So he fell in love with that car. And I was at the time out doing the Gold Rush Rally this year with Arnie Toman. So we get to kind of the halfway point at Gold Rush and we're spending an extra day in Denver because we were then going to fly to Nashville. The cars were being shipped to Nashville and we'd pick up the second half of the rally there. So I'm hanging out at the hotel and I get a call from John Tamarian expecting that he's got somebody that probably wants the Spiker but with no real intention of parting with it. And what he says as I pick up the phone is, Ed, I think one of us is going to have to get our checkbook out. And I said, well, that's a strange thing to hear from John Tamarian because he buys the nicest examples of the coolest cars on earth and I try to buy the worst example of the coolest cars on earth. So we never really compete over cars and that's a good thing for the relationship. And so it would be odd for us both to legitimately be interested in buying a car that would inevitably be pretty big based on the tone of the conversation. The next thing he said was also interesting. He said, she's ready to sell it. Now, not to be sexist or chauvinistic, but knowing all the cars that he and I have discussed, there is only one that is owned by a woman. And she's known to take the car out to events, and it was a really, really special car. I'd seen the car just a few months prior at the Miami Concours, and it was a 2012 Bugatti Veyron Supersport. Now, they made less than 50 Supersports. They made 450 Veyrons total. When the early cars came out, they immediately set the top speed record at 253 miles an hour, but then the 1,200 horsepower version in the Supersport in 2010, well, there was an episode of Top Gear with James May trying it, but their test driver went a little bit faster than James May did, set the world record again at 268 miles per hour. Now, this particular car is without question, at least in my humble opinion, the best Supersport that exists because of the spec. Now, there were five world speed record cars, and this car would easily be confused with one of those, but there is one very significant difference and many other you know, smaller differences. The biggest one is that in addition to being a totally bare carbon car and having bright metallic orange accents along the rockers and along the front bumper and in the rear, the car has an orange interior, and it is spectacular. I've said many times that orange is my favorite color in cars, and I don't usually get to buy orange cars because they bring a premium, but this car was perfect. Now, unlike the stuff that I would normally like to find that drove into some water or was repossessed or crashed or whatever, the car's history is perfect. It actually came up for sale, I remember, in early 2017. Now, at that time, I have no money. I'm kind of before we had started the YouTube channel, we're still struggling to try to get the VinWiki app, some traction, doing whatever we can to get there. And so I was in no position to buy it. And I actually thought at the time it would probably be worth like, I don't know, four to five million dollars. But when I called Miller Motor Cars, even without the ability to buy it, they said that they were asking about two and a half. And I made a post somewhere, I looked and I couldn't find it, but I it literally had a picture of the car for sale. And I said, it's time to figure out how much everything I own is worth because it is as aspirationally as I could ever want to be like the car that I would want. Now I asked John like, you know, how much does she want? And he said, I don't really know. I saw one sell last year for one seven, and I, I'd been told that was a pretty good deal. This car is nicer, both in spec and its condition. The only one that is listed anywhere I found at the time was in Monaco, and it was like two three. And so I was like, I have no idea what the thing is worth, but it's probably give or take $2 million, probably a little bit more. Whatever that number was, was going to be very significant into whether or not I had a prayer of being able to buy this car because it was going to have to be a cartwheel deal. And what I mean by that is that in a normal car deal where you have some cars you have to get rid of and you have a car that you wanna buy, those cars will be numbered as trades by the dealer at what's pretty much a wholesale value. You pay the difference and you buy this thing. There was no chance that I could do that because the cars that I would have to get rid of in order for it to be remotely possible would have to get just 
pie in the sky, as much money as they could ever be worth on their best day. And my cars are never in their best day. There's always a laundry list of issues. All of them at that time and still to this day have a lot of issues. And so it was going to be a hugely complicated deal. But on that call, I told John, let's figure it out. I want it. I want to figure out a way to do it. Inevitably, it was going to require that I get rid of two out of the three Mercies that I've got, sell the Spiker, sell the R8 that I was driving on Gold Rush at the time, but wouldn't be able to sell until I got finished a couple months later using it for Car Trek 9, sell everything that I possibly could, and still have a pretty significant check to write, but I was going to try. So John puts together a contract with the seller, agrees to a number, and gets us a two-month window in which to buy the car. Now that was a little bit surprising to me because deals that drag on that long have a very, very low chance of success. Generally, somebody decides they're less interested over time, or if it's going to take that long, it just never really comes to fruition. But I'd had many people over the months and years prior tell me which of my cars they would like to buy if I was ever interested in selling them, which I never intended to be. And so I started putting some feelers out there. And within a few days, I had somebody commit to buy my Verde Draco LP640 and my Rosso Andromeda salvage title LP670 SV. And of the three cars, I think I really do like the 09 Roadster that I recently reconditioned and have in great driving shape as my favorite of the three Mercies. I love them all. They all have their own moments, their own kind of circumstances in which they're the perfect car. But if I was just going to keep one, that would be the one I wanted to pick. So I really liked the way this had come together. They were going to take most of what I was going to owe and assuming we could get pretty decent money for the Spiker, you know, it was a manageable check to write or a loan to get to get to the where we needed to be on this Bugatti. Now, the problem with that two-month window is that John Tamarian was going to be in Europe doing several family and work things for a month of it. And so, as I told him, all right, this guy's gonna buy this car, this guy's gonna buy this car, you're working stuff on the Spiker, Sylvester Stallone had entered the picture wanting to buy the car, he was gonna send a representative. As we learned, he's now getting a divorce and is potentially hiding assets. So. Subsequently, that deal fizzled out, but he had other people that had walked into the showroom that had seen him post pictures on social media that were interested in the car. And, you know, we were trying to get the car inspected. Now, I've never in my life had a pre-purchase inspection done, but he wouldn't even let me entertain the idea of not doing that. And that does make sense. I mean, there can be some insanely expensive things that can happen with this car, and the maintenance is preposterous. It was pretty fresh on its oil change. It had gotten tires last year at a cost of $48,000, which is way more than we believe their own tires cost, but that's what they cost on the invoice. And all the servicing had been crazy expensive, and it had always been serviced routinely at a Bugatti dealer, which was daunting because you know, sometimes you see a car that's been independently serviced and you think, all right, well, I can just keep cutting some corners and not paying $20,000 for oil changes and this will be wonderful. This one, you were going to have to either break that path or figure out how to pay for it. And I wasn't super excited about either of those options. So I'm going back and forth with all the people that are trying to buy my cars and talking about the things that are obviously wrong with them, what I need to fix in order for them to be happy, what they're okay accepting as is, working on ordering parts, everything, because each of them was going to be a real process. And without any of the deals working, the big picture thing doesn't work. And if the big picture deal doesn't work, then I don't want to sell any of them. So it was a very, very chicken egg problem with needing to sell the cars. Strangely and maybe serendipitously, that night at dinner, people start looking at their phones and watching the stock market start to collapse. And this was a point in June of this year where stocks just really started to dive. And people generally know, at least in the position of people that are out doing Gold Rush, that that does not mean you start selling stuff off. It just means you've got a wave you're probably going to need to ride out. But that's troubling when you have people who have agreed, at least you know, with a few conditions, to pay very, very significant prices for stuff that you're trying to sell. And I knew that there was always going to be a chance that at the 11th hour or at the second hour, people were going to back out. And so I'm talking back and forth to them. And as John's not really in a position to like send out paperwork quickly, collect deposits quickly, start financing cars for people that need financing, it was getting harder and harder as the days and even as the weeks went by to keep these guys as hot as they are on owning the cars. They're all significant, they're all cool, but trying to buy a salvage title Mercy or the highest mileage manual LP640 in the country is not always the most exciting premise, even if you're getting a good deal relative to what the big market might be. 
So as the pieces all come together, I plan a trip down there to test drive the car with the owner. John's still out of the country, but his team at Curated kind of helps set everything up. I go in there, I spend several hours with her, with the car, and it is wonderful. We agree that we'll move forward with the PPI, we get it over to Bugatti Broward, they take a look at it over the course of about two and a half weeks, and they eventually say, everything checks out, the car's in exceptional condition. There were a couple of things, there was a little droop in the headliner that they wanted to have addressed, but she had paid a lot of money to have that addressed in the year prior, so that was still kind of a warranty item. And so regardless, it ended up becoming exactly the car that I wanted to buy, and I was trying as hard as I could at the time to hold everything together, and it seemed like everything was going to work. So Tamarian eventually gets back in, and my guys are really waffling back and forth as to whether they're gonna buy my Mercies. And again, if they don't pay all the money, they don't get them because nothing, I, I can't take a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars less of whatever they might try to negotiate because then I can't afford the Bugatti on the other side of the deal. To be quite honest, over the next week or two, the whole thing just kind of unravels. Sylvester Stallone backs out of the spiker. One of them just gets cold feet about the market and seeing the losses in crypto and everything else that they were experiencing. It was just not really going to work. And the other one was struggling to get financed on the other Mercy. And so we just kind of reached a point where we were nearing the expiration of the contract date. Tamarian had somebody else that really wanted to buy the car, and I was okay with that, obviously, because if he was going to sell it to them for maybe even a little bit more money than me and take different trades and get stuff that works well for his business, and he certainly had given me the full chance to buy the car at the number that we've been able to negotiate. So regardless, it was just kind of a point where I've got to back away. I'm happy with my stuff. Realistically, I'm not remotely rich enough to own even a cheap Veyron, much less uh, one that's over $2 million, and so I kind of give up. And he has another deal worked out. He's talking to the owner about that. And eventually she decides that she really loves the car too much. Her kids love the car. Everybody loves the thing, which I certainly can't fault them for. She'd always said she liked driving the F50 more, but she'd put thousands and thousands of miles on each of them. But it always just felt like so much of a stretch that I never knew if it was going to work. I love everything about the car. I actually like it more than a Chiron, even though I was probably tickling the money that you could have used to buy a Chiron. The Veyron was just always the dream car, in the same way that many people like Countach's more than Diablo's, or Diablo's more than Mercy's, or Mercy's more than Aventador's. There's just that car that does it for you, and for me, this was it. So, she decided to keep it. Nobody gets to buy it, except hopefully me sometime in the future. I've started to kick around some cheaper cars that wouldn't require me selling all mine, which is a nice idea. Although I really did love the idea of not having as many cars. I know that sounds crazy, but like when I see Hoovy talking about having 30 or 40 cars, that sounds awful. It's great to have that variety, the diversity, whatever, but cars don't sit well. And I don't have a long daily commute. I don't do a lot of daily driving. I do a ton of long trips and big drives, so I put a lot of miles on cars each year. But if I have at the moment, I think I have 12 or 13 cars. Trying to just drive each of them a couple times a month is hard because they're in different places, and I just don't have that many miles to drive on a daily basis. So the idea of one Mercy, one Bugatti, and kind of the revolving door of cars for Car Trek and other projects, that sounded perfect. So I don't know if I'll ever get there. I don't know if I'll ever buy a Bugatti, and ultimately I am okay with not. People criticize the cars for not being super athletic sports cars or cars that you could really just carve up a mountain road with. There really are grand touring cars, but I like that about them. Kind of in the scope of hyper cars of today, they are the most approachable, the most daily usable, the cars that you could just go to dinner in or even let your wife drive or anything like that, and they'll love it. Maybe one day, maybe not. Regardless, it's always the chase that's more fun. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe, maybe ownership will live up to it, but either way, that's why I didn't buy the coolest Bugatti on earth. When you get a ticket, no matter where it happens, it's more important than ever to fight every one. And the perfect partner in that fight is the Ticket Clinic. When you get a ticket, you're facing costly insurance, premium increases, points on your license, fines, risk of suspension, jail time, and they can help you avoid all of that. They've got offices in Florida and in California, but they can help you fight a ticket through their network of attorneys no matter where in the United States you get one. You can text a picture of your ticket to 305305, or you can check them out now at the link in the description below. So thank them for their support of VinWiki, of Car Trek, and fight your ticket with the Ticket Clinic.